Morning. Welcome to 2015 in Netherlands Church of Christ. It's good to see each of you here this morning. If you're visiting with us, we uh, hope that, that you'll want to be back with us. Maybe you made a New Year resolution to, to be more active in local church work. If that's the case, we'd love to have you be a part here at Netherlands. A lot going on here in this, this coming year. Um, we'll have the calendars to you as soon as we get them from the publisher. I know that's something a lot of you are looking forward to getting. But as soon as we get it from the publisher, we'll, 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 we'll have them to you. Um, hopefully, that'll be this week. Uh, if you're going to follow the 2015 uh, Bible reading challenge, uh, those copies are available. We distributed them in the, I know in the ladies' class this morning, adult Bible study class. If you happen to not get one and you want one, there are some that out there on the, uh, in the foyer on the counter. Uh, and we're going this year, the, we're going to try to read it chronologically. So you've read through Genesis chapter 8. Those of you picked it up Wednesday night. I read the Genesis chapter 8 this morning, and you started Job today. So that's sort of the chronologically where sort of things fall in the Bible. So it will be moving around a little bit. I think it's a very, very profitable study. At least for right now, I may change my mind later, but at least for right now, uh, on Wednesday nights, I'll be taking sort of a survey of our readings of that week, and we'll discuss them in a Wednesday night Bible study class, so um, uh, and the adult class on Wednesday night. So that's sort of the, the plan right now. We started that last week, and, and uh, so that's sort of the plan, at least for right now, to do that for Wednesday nights. On Sunday mornings, we're studying for the book of Hebrews and the adult class and women's Bible study class, I think, are starting a new curriculum uh, soon, if not already. And so if you'd like to join that, you can encourage to do so as well on Sunday mornings. Uh, encourage you to be back with us tonight. Brother Tyler Gall is going to be with us. And Tyler spoke for us several times last year. And he's going to be speaking some for us on Sunday nights this year. So Brother Tyler will be with us this evening uh, and come out and have a, a, a good uh, support him and have a good worship service tonight for that as well. We've been studying lessons from the Gospel of John for the past few weeks. Uh, I've enjoyed my study. Hopefully you're, you're gaining from it as well. Uh, but John's motivating factor was he said well, he wanted people to believe. And he wrote his gospel for people to believe that Jesus Christ. And in believing in him, I have life in his name. So it's very important. It's his motivation. Uh, it's a gospel belief. And so that, that's what we, we uh, um, need to be uh, conscious of as we go about reading and studying through the book of John. Uh, Brother Dusty read this morning, uh, John chapter 6, 16 through 21, uh, Jesus on the Sea of Galilee, and literally walking on the Sea of Galilee uh, during a storm in the life of the apostles. So I guess that if you wanted to theme this lesson this morning, it's, it's living through storms. Uh, 2014 was somewhat of a tumultuous year for me personally, lost family, family members and uh, and, and there's happiness when you, when a child gets married, but there's also a lot of adjustment to that. You know, uh, Tammy and I are now officially empty nesters. Uh, it's uh, Tammy, myself, and Piper, our little new little dog, and uh, so we, we we we're adjusting to to that point in life, and then just a lot of things happening. You know, in 2014 for me personally, but the one thing that got me through many of the challenges I had was my faith. And being in fellowship with y'all and being my church family, you help sustain. My faith. Uh, in times of loss, you were there with encouragement. Uh, and, and you've been there in times of celebration as well. And, and I don't know what people without church do. I often comment that. I don't know what people do who don't have a church family. You know, I've been asked to hold funerals for, for various different folks. Of course, many here in the congregation. But there's been times where I've held church funerals for people who are just unchurched. They just... the. the uh, a couple of funeral homes, they said, would you help us out? And, and if I can, I, I do. It's something like that. And I've literally held one funeral. There were six people there for that funeral. It was just, it's just not the way to end your life. It was an older person. She lived many years, but they just never was churched. And, and, and just, you know, and I held the funeral for her husband. probably twice that at his funeral. Then she died a few years later. And it was like six people there. And how can you not impact more people than that? And it's just a challenge. But there'll be other storms in life for some of you. Some maybe had a tough economic year last year. Maybe it's a job thing. Maybe it's a relationship thing. Maybe it's, a, maybe it's a health thing. We don't know, but there will be storms in 2015. That's just the nature of living in a broken world. And so this morning's lesson is, is sort of maybe, you know, Chris, Brother Chris said this morning, so you're talking about resolutions. I said, well, not, not really. It was tempting, but I said, no, I'm going to sort of stay with the text in John. But the text really is a pretty good point to start out 2015, understanding that, that life may come. And life may come at you with challenges. 
there may be great opportunities too. You know, I, I know every year we get excited. I think last year was sort of a, a banner year. I think we had more graduates last year than we'd ever had people graduating high school in our congregation. That's always sort of an exciting time. There'll be great opportunities coming for some of people in 2015. But there'll also be challenges to people of faith too. So the lesson text, Jesus has just fed over 5,000 people with basically a snack, you know, basically the equivalent of a few, few pickled fish and, and five pita breads. And, and just feeds a miraculous number of people. And after this, Jesus sends his apostles into the Sea of Galilee, and he just goes on his own. And he really sends them into a raging storm. Now, John, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all talk about this story and add different dimensions to it. John says in verse 18, the sea arose because a great wind was blowing. Then Mark 6, 48 says, then he saw them straining at the rowing for the wind was against them. That's Jesus saw them straining at the rowing. And then Matthew chapter 14, verse 24, but the boat was now in the middle of the sea, tossed by the waves for the wind was contrary. It was just a tough place. Now, I, I, I've never been a seagoing person. I have taken a cruise, and, 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 but that's about it. But, but I have been in the middle of Center Hill Lake in a, in a thunderstorm on a houseboat with two inexperienced brothers trying to get us to the, to the other side of the lake. We spent two hours circling an island in the middle of Center Hill Lake. They just said, just hug the shore. Just hug the shore we'll be fine. Well, we circled the same island for two hours. Yeah. So, and I guess that, that looks familiar. <laughs> oh, no, no. So, uh, I don't know if you've ever had my mother, and, and I think it was 1972. It might have been 71, but I think it was 72. It was the year after my father died. But she was working for Norwalk Furniture, and they'd had a good year at Norwalk. And uh, that, that was a furniture manufacturer, and, and she sold, I remember mean, she sold skirts. I thought that was funny. She sold skirts for furniture, but... But uh, to sort of reward them that year, the, 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 the plant manager decided he was going to take a crew to Florida for, for deep sea fishing. And that's what he was going to reward them for that year. So, so under a lot of pressure from her co-workers and stuff, she decided to go. She was, she was not wooded too off alone. She still had four kids at home. Uh, but she went anyways. And even though it took a lot of pressure and stuff to, to go, she went anyways. Well, they had a nice trip down to Florida. You know, they got deep sea food. But the day of the trip, they went out on this boat. And they got out in the ocean, and a great storm came up. And she said, people got seasick. They were crying and carrying on. She says, but I didn't get too worried. So the captain of the boat, she overheard him tell his son, I can't see anything. Get out on the balance so you can tell where we're going. <laughs> and she said she was scared at that point. And she said she prayed to God. She says, if I ever get home, I will never leave my kids alone again. <laughs> that, was, that was her prayer. And, and they finally got in. They got fight back. And she brought back a bunch of red snapper. And we had a big fish fry at the, at the house. I think I was about eight years old at the time. But, but, um, but that was her experience. But, but I've never had it. Maybe some of you had been in the middle of the lake or middle of a storm. But it is a terrifying experience to be at, at the mercy of the elements. You have no control. You have no power. Storms come like that. Storms come and, and, and they take away your orientation. You don't know what is up and what is down. You don't know what is right and what is left. You don't know what is east, north, or south. You just, you just your orientation. You can't get your bearings and you're out of control. It's interesting that, 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 that they only get about three or four miles into the... And sea of Galilee is not a really large sea. It's really a freshwater lake. They only get three or four miles in, but they're going against the wind. Contrary to the wind, they're rowing against the wind. You know, you can find storms one of two ways in life. You can do like Jonah did, disobey God... <laughs> And find yourself in a storm. Remember the story of Jonah? How God wanted him to go to Nineveh. He didn't want to go to Nineveh. So he got inside. He got to Tarsus. And God sent a great storm. And you know the story. The ship was caught in storm. They were throwing things overboard. And he finally said, throw me overboard. And he said, we're not going to do that. And he says, that's the only way that God's going to stop this. So they throw him overboard. And God sends a great fish to swallow him. And he spends three days and three nights in the belly of the fish. So you can get to a storm that way by trying to go against God. But what's what interesting, sometimes you can get into a storm by going with God.
Think of Daniel in his life. Taken to a strange city. Made into a eunuch. And yet following and worshiping God. Praying. Fasting. Fighting against the culture he was in. Standing up with what was right. What about Moses just going to the king of Egypt and says, let my people go. Sometimes you can, you can find a storm by trying to go away from God, but also sometimes trying to live with God and for God and following God. You're going to find a, you're going to find a storm as well. And what's interesting is that Jesus actually put them in the boat and sent them into the storm. He knew everything. And he put them in the boat, Matthew says, and he sent them away. Made his disciples get into the boat. The man says, well, I don't know. It's looks stormy on that. Get in the boat. Get in the boat. These were seafaring men. They knew, they knew how to read the signs. You know, read at night, sailors a lot. Read the morning, sailor take warning. That's the one I've always heard. I never was a sailor, but apparently if it's read in the morning, the storms may be coming in. And he says, get in the boat. You see, sometimes simply trying to live to do the right thing, you're going you're gonna to hit a storm. Trying to be the kid at school who obeys the teacher, who does your homework, who doesn't use coarse language, who doesn't tell dirty jokes and stories, who goes against the culture, who said, this is right and that's wrong and I'm doing what's wrong. I'm only going to do what's right. That may put you in the face of a storm. Trying to do the right thing in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a work situation or an employment situation that, that other people aren't living that same values and standard that will put you in the face of the storm. Just saying to the culture, no, we're not living that way. Just sometimes following God's going to put you in the face of the storm. And so you're going to find yourself headlong in some contrary winds. In 2015, many of us will experience that simply by trying to do what's right. It's going to be difficult. Trying to be people of value, people of character, people of standards, just trying to do what is the right thing to do is going to cause you a contrary wind. It's going to be difficult. But you know what? The psalmist says this. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascended to heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand will shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. There is nothing that you're going to face in 2015 that Christ isn't going to be there with you. There's nothing... That you're going to experience, as Brother Chris said, as a Christian, that you'll not have support. So we sang that song a few minutes ago. If the skies above you are gray, you're feeling so blue. What's that? Sing and be happy. You will never face a storm of life alone if you are with Christ. Never alone. Never alone. Jesus knows what aloneness is or to be lonely. Remember the night of his betrayal? How he went to the garden and said, watch. And he went and prayed to God. And he poured it out all out before the Father. He says, Father, if you will, let this cup pass from me. But if not your will, but my will be done. And, and it said that, 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 that blood came forth from his forehead. He prayed so hard. And he comes back and what did he find disciples? Asleep. Asleep. The most difficult, scariest, challenging moment in his life. And where does he find his friends? But I'll promise you this, whatever you face in 2015, Christ will never be asleep. He will be with you. He will sustain you. I've often liked, there's 
two or three different variations of it. I'd often like the, the, the poem about the footprints in the sand, about how the person looks back upon their life and, and, and they're sort of talking to the Lord and they see two, foot, two sets of footprints in the sand, but looking over the, the sands of their life, the time of their life, at the moments where they were most desperate, at the moments they were most challenged, at the moments they were most difficult, there's only one set of footprints. And the person laments to God, why did you abandon me at those moments? Why did you leave me? Why was there only one set of footprints? Why did I walk alone to which the Lord responds, my child, I was carrying you at those times. You see, our faith tells us that, that Jesus will never leave us alone in times of the storm. In fact, in John chapter 6, verse 19, so that when it rode about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing in the boat, and they were afraid. In fact, if you read the other Gospels, it's even a little bit funnier. Matthew says they thought it was a ghost. I don't know what kind of sea demon they thought was coming after them, but they were scared because people don't walk on water. They were tired. They were scared. I guess one of the things we need to take from this is that it's okay to be afraid. You may be facing challenges. You may have things you're afraid of. It's okay to be afraid. The only difference is, as Christians, you should know who to cry out to. It's not the Ghostbusters, if you think it's a ghost. It's not your cell phone provider. It's not AT and T. It's not any, who do you cry out to? You cry out to the Lord. Jesus said to them, "It is I. Do not be afraid." I don't know, maybe we can make great emphasis over things we shouldn't emphasize, but you know what? There's two things you need to be aware of here. One, as Jesus says, first, who he is. Then, don't be afraid. You need to know who Jesus is, and then you don't need to be afraid. Now, if you don't know who it is, you need to stay afraid. It's very important just to recognize that you need to know who the Lord is, then don't be afraid. Not being afraid and then not knowing the Lord can put you in really dangerous situa situations and circumstances. But Jesus first identifies himself. It is I do not be afraid. You need to know who your life preserver is. And then don't be afraid. You need to know the Lord. We do Bible readings every year. Some people, I don't know how many years you consecutively have done this. Some people have done this almost every year that we've been doing. And I will say that, that that's one way of getting to know the Lord a little bit better. Is through reading his word. We do Bible study classes. That's another way to know the Lord better. Is just getting around and, 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 and talking about it and studying it. And opening up God's word and, 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 and asking some questions and sharing some experiences. Sometimes you're going to have to test your faith and commit things to God. As you plan for the year, what does your giving look like? What does your, 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 your spiritual disciplines look like? I mean, what, what does your, your, your choices for recreation look like? Are they things that are going to help you get closer to, to other Christians or the Lord? Or, or are they things going to take you away? The psalmist says in the 23rd Psalm, Yea, though walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. I, I'm a little embarrassed to sort of admit this. I, I held one perspective on scripture for a long time and it was in a bible study class on a wednesday night here we were talking about this talking about this concept that david was a man after god's own heart and forever i held the perspective that david was a man like god and that he had a heart like god 
And then yet that sort of challenged me is because I looked at that in Scripture and I thought, man, David sure messed up a whole lot for someone who's supposed to be like God. And that really challenged me. And I held that view for a long time, for many, many years. And I thought when the Bible said that David was a man after God's own heart, that, that it meant like he was made like God after his image or whatever. And I held that for a long time. And it was on a Wednesday night Bible study class, and, and it was Sister Lori Austin that said, well, what that passage means to me is that David was a man pursuing God's heart. Now, finally, a light bulb went off my head. That's exactly what that means. That's how David was a man after God. He was pursuing after God's heart. That's what that, that made all, that resolved all the other conflicts I'd created in my mind by the position I held just because another Christian said, listen, this is what it means to me. And I'm the preacher. I'm supposed to know that stuff. You see, because a man pursued God's heart, he can make statements like, even though I'm walking the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you are with me. How did he get to that point? How did he know how to deal with the storms of life? Because he had spent time going after God and pursuing God and, and relentlessly going after him. And after, didn't mean he didn't make mistakes. Didn't mean he didn't screw up. I'll tell you what, but it meant that he had learned something about God. That he was with him wherever he was. Heaven, hell, no matter where he was, that God was with him. Sometimes we need to take some risks to help develop our faith. And we don't get this from John. I'll be real, real, real fair. John doesn't mention this part in the story. But Matthew does. Matthew chapter 14, 28 through 29. And Peter answered and said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, come. And when Peter had come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Isn't that awesome? I don't know, I, Peter was always sort of the bossy one, seems like to me. I can imagine what that four miles in the row in the boat was like. Peter's probably at the helm saying, you know, row, row, row. You know, he's probably telling everyone what to do. You know, I just sort of get the image of Peter. And he says, Lord, if it's you, just tell me to walk on the water. And he gets out. He tests his faith. He says, if you're doing that, I want to do that too. And he gets out. Now, some people give Peter a hard time, <laughs> you know, because what happens next? But remember, there's 11, there's 11 chickens who won't even try to get out there. He steps out in faith. Lord, just let it as you let, let it, let, let me walk on the water. And he walks. But what happens? But when he saw that the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and began to sink. And he cried out saying, Lord, save me. When he took his eyes off Jesus, he got in trouble. So in 2015, when the storms happen, do not take your eyes off Jesus. Because you'll get in trouble. Because the wind will blow and it will be scary. But always remember what to say. Lord, save me. Peter, Peter knew who to call out to. Lord, save me. Three of the most powerful words that mankind can say. Lord, save me. What happened? What happened to these men because of this? Matthew chapter 14, verse 33 says, Then those who were in the boat came and worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. Storms should bring us to reality. Who's the master of the storm? And storms should move us to worship. As I was preparing for this lesson and thinking about it, I, I got to thinking, man, wouldn't it be awesome for us to meet together for worship on some Sunday morning and God sends some just raunchous, rambunctious storm for the wind to blow and the rain to fall 
and the thunder roll and the lightning crash and the power goes out and we just sing and worship God like crazy. Wouldn't that be awesome? As soon as I went, no, I don't, wouldn't care for that. Just the same, it's all right with you, preacher. But wouldn't it be awesome just to be gathered together in the middle of just a horrible storm, just singing our praises to God and thanking Him and singing, sing and be happy? Or how great thou art, O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the world thy hands has made. I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder. Thy power throughout the universe displays. You know that song was written by a man who survived a thunderstorm in the in a woods. He was in the woods and got caught in an electrical storm and thought he was going to die. And when he got through the storm, he says, Oh, I need to write this down. Then sings my soul, my saving God to thee. How great thou art. How great thou art. Coming through a storm should make anyone worshipful. I'm not trying to be prophetic. I just know there's going to be challenges for us. This is because we live in a broken world. Don't know what 2015 may bring. Hopefully blessings to everybody. But I want to assure you that if it storms, you have people who care for you. You have a family of God here at Nettleton that will pray with you, for you, that will be with you to assist you in those difficult times. You have a God who never forgets you, who never leaves you. He never go to sleep. He's not going to take a nap during your suffering. He's going to be there to carry you, sustain you, to get you through to the other side. And at your scariest, most frightened moment, you have three of the most powerful words you can ever say in the human language. What are they? Lord, save me. If you're not a child of God, why would you continue one second more in this year in that state? This is the first Lord's Day of the year. Confess as your Savior, bear with Him in baptism. Live in a relationship with Him. And you can be as certain that any storm you face, you will not be alone. If you need prayers on your behalf, maybe you need a word of encouragement. Whatever you need to do, once you come as Brother Chris leads us in the song, you select it.